and so it is. <coughs> well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us. And, and while, while I was in that treatment, the, the image that came to me was a chick poking its way out of the eggshell. The shell is necessary for a time. It serves a purpose. It protects the egg as it develops into the chick. But there comes a time when the chick knows, the chick knows that it is being constrained and held back by the very things that were necessary for its growth. In other words, the shell was only a phase, was only a temporary condition, a temporary state. And there is a knowing, not a knowledge, but a knowing. An, an, <clears throat> an instinct within that chick that tells it now's the time. Now's the time to start pecking. Now's the time to start chipping away. Now is the time to escape from that which was once protecting you from the outside world. But it is now holding you captive. And life, life has provided so perfectly for that moment that the chick even has a special tooth, an egg tooth, whose only purpose is to serve is to help it, to help it break away, to help it get out. So I invite you to take that image. Remember I, <clears throat> when I mentioned Vernon Howard, Howard's books on psychopictography, he said, the image stays with us a long time after the words of the message. Right? So we are each and every one, that little, that little chick. We are each and every one surrounded and encapsulated by, by these barriers of ideas, of things that we, we believe to be true, but are not necessarily true. And they served us well for a time. They served us well. They, they allowed us to function in this world. They allowed us to get to where we are today. But now might be the time for us to decide, right? The chick has instinct to tell it when to start pecking out. We have to make that decision. We have to set our intention. Now might be the time. Today might be the day, as Rabbi Hillel said, if not us, who? If not now, when? Now is the time. We are the people. So for the last few weeks, we've kind of been we've been tossing around these ideas of of happiness. Remember, we, we talked for almost a month or so about happiness and happiness as being a, a first cause motivation. That if if we just simply follow happiness, do more of the things that make us happy and less of the things that make us unhappy that this happiness will be our guide that leads us into a greater experience of life, into a greater experience of love, into, into the experience of the very presence of God. You may have read Alan Cohn's book, Joy is My Compass, same, same idea. What is it, what is it that allows for that experience of happiness? And we went on to define what happiness was and explain it was different than pleasure. You know, and it that sometimes we get confused and, and we we pursue things that give us pleasure, thinking that they're going to give us happiness. But then we find out that the very object of our pleasure becomes a cause of sadness in our life. We may think that a particular food makes us happy, and then we overindulge in it, and and our bodies become ill. For example. So that which we thought was going to make us happy, in fact, made us sick. So I mentioned a work by the Dalai Lama um, 
on the art of happiness. And this, this idea of the art of happiness is something that runs through uh, different, different schools of Buddhism. There are lots of lectures on it. There are lots of uh, videos on YouTube on it. This idea that, that pursuing happiness, that learning what happiness is, that pursuing happiness is, is something that is good for the growth of our soul, for the growth of our soul. Now, we also mentioned that this is possible. It is possible for us to do this by training our mind. This is a quote from the Dalai Lama. Training our mind. So then think about that. The, the implication then is, is that an untrained mind is not as likely to experience happiness because happiness takes place within the mind, within this experience we have that we call mind even though even though people really don't agree <clears throat> on what the terms consciousness thought and mind mean we have some kind of an experience that we call mind we say well that's my i made up my mind my mind is made up i thought this i had that idea all these things that we say where we we identify with the mind. We get to the point where we think that I am the mind, you know. I think, therefore, I am. You know, we believe that. We believe that. This morning I was watching um, a short video with Thich Nhat Hanh, and he said, I am what? <laughs> I think, therefore, I am. What are you? What are you? What is this I am that we are? So to learn, Dr. Holmes tells us, to learn how to think is to learn how to live. To learn how to think is to learn how to live. And we must ultimately come to the realization that we are the only ones who can do that for ourselves. No one else can do it for us. Now, not that there's a shortage of people who will tell you what you need to think. You know, there are, there are bazillions of them. If you don't believe me, just, just go on social media. They're all posting. But you and I, you and I are completely responsible. And not only responsible, but accountable for the quality of our thought. Because life is made up of our thoughts, the outpitching of our thoughts. You, know, you cast your bread upon the waters and it shall return unto you. My words shall not return unto me void. Uh, Isaiah said, Buddhism tells us that everything that you experience is a result of what you have thought. The Stoic philosophers tell us what the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. And Jesus said, pray believing in your heart. Pray believing in your heart. And so it is. The same message comes to us from, from many different teachings, many different ways. And if we are to take it seriously, then we have to stop and ask ourselves, well, what is thinking? What is thinking? And am I a victim of my thoughts? Do I generate thoughts? Do I simply become aware of thoughts? And can I choose which thoughts to engage or not to engage? You know? I remember when I first um, came upon meditation as a practice in the 70s, I thought the purpose of it was to completely stop thought. Now, now mind you, there are some, some gurus, some masters who will say, yes, they can do that. But for the average person to begin meditation and sit down and say, my goal is to stop thought, it was a fool's errand. It was an exercise in futility because I could not stop, stop it, you know. It's like trying not, not to think of the white elephant. We can't do that. But what we can do is, is we can learn to observe how, how these thoughts work and we can learn whether to engage them or not. We can pick and choose which ones to engage. And I think that's an important, an important lesson. I stopped meditating for many, many years because 
I, I didn't see the point. It was kind of an exercise in trying to do something that could not be done. For, at least I couldn't do it. And then I came to kind of a gentle, gentler approach, which said, you know, just don't become entangled. Don't become entangled with your thoughts. And you've heard me explain this uh, many times. You, we would come to the center on, on uh, uh, Saturday nights for meditation, and we'd sit in a circle, and you sit down, and you start to meditate, and you, you're aware of your breath, you're breathing in, and all of a sudden, your mind <laughs> says, um, do you have enough gas to get home tonight? And you start to think, well, let's see, well, did I look at the gauge on the way over? No, when's the last time I got gas? Oh, I remember I got gas last Thursday. Oh, well, well where did I drive since last Thursday? And now, you, now you're, you're not meditating anymore. You're, you're chasing your memories of where you've been. And then finally you decide, well, yes, I do need gas on the way home. And you start to come back to your meditation, and then all of a sudden you say, well, if, as long as i got to stop for gas, do I need bread and milk? You see, and then you, you just... You just repeat that process, you know, well, when's the last time I got milk? Well, when's the last time I got bread? Well, how much bread have we used since then? How much milk? And you're not meditating, you see. You are entangled with your thoughts. But, but that simple exercise has shown you the working of mind, the working of mind. And f remember, I think it was last week we said the definition that we were going to use for, for mind was the movement of consciousness, the movement of consciousness. Thought, the movement of consciousness. Thought is a movement of consciousness, Dr. Holmes tells us. So we become aware of the fact that we're trying to sit and meditate, and yet, as, as Osho tells us, it's as if our mind is a stray dog that is just wandering from here to there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I chuckle because we used to have hounds, and they would get away every once in a while, and they would just stay like 10 steps ahead of you, but they would wander from here to there, and they would smell this, and they would smell that, and they would smell the other thing. And the only way I could catch them was to figure out which way the wind was blowing and get in front of them, go around the block and get in front of them, because they were always heading into the wind, following the smells. So our mind is like a stray dog. It wanders, and we follow it. And if we become aware of that, if, if nothing else comes from attempting to, to sit and meditate, if we become aware of the fact that, that our mind is like a stray dog, then we can, we can hope to begin to train it. Because training it then is going to help us to be happier. And to be happier is going to help us to grow spiritually. So we also talked about the fact last week that we belong. We belong. And of course, now, when I, when I hear words, usually songs come into my head. And I had Pat Benatar stuck in my head. We belong. We belong. And of course, I only ever knew the chorus of that song. When I went back and looked up the lyrics, <laughs> they're not appropriate for what we're talking about at all. But we belong. See, one of, one of, the, one of the first things that we we come to um, realize as we start to grow, as Dr. Holmes tells us, is that all the problems that we face are, are due to ideas of separation. We are separated from whatever we think our good is. We are separated from whatever we think our God is. We are separated from our own selves. We are separated from our bodies, or our bodies are something not to be trusted. We get all of these different ideas as we are growing up. And many of them are ideas of separation. They are not ideas of unity and of wholeness and of oneness. And remember when we're talking about love, say that love is the experience of that unity. It is the experience of oneness, the experience of wholeness. That which I truly love, I feel completely at one with, at one mint, not atonement, at one mint. Completely, completely at one with my beloved, you see. Now, as we come into this world, we are taught a very small circle of who we can love, 
who we can experience that oneness with. We are separated from all others. But as we grow, we start to recognize that this separation is only an idea, only a thought, only an opinion. But in fact, all people, all persons, essentially want the same thing, which is to be happy. Dr. Holmes tells us, I am not my brother's keeper. I am my brother. I am my brother. See, that is oneness. That is unity. That is wholeness. Joseph Campbell, in one of his lectures, he explains that <clears throat> there's a saying, it says, no greater love can one have than to lay down their life for another. And he put that into, into the context of soldiers on the battlefield. And he says, what would bring a soldier on the battlefield to deliberately sacrifice his own life to save another? And his explanation was, at that moment, there is a complete absence of self. And the other is as equally important. Can we experience the unity, the oneness, the wholeness with all others? Can we love? Right? And again, the scripture tells us if you don't know love, you don't know God. And perfect love casts out all fear. And if you think about fear, what is the root of fear when we are afraid of others? That they're not us. They're not like us. We're not one with them. They want our stuff. They want to hurt us. All of those things. So we belong to life. We are one with life. We are one with each other. We are one with that which has created us. You know. I like to say, dance with the one who brung you. Dance with the one who brung you. We have to learn that we belong. And once we start to learn that we belong, we, we can take a step back and look at, objectively, at life itself, at life itself. All the different aspects of life itself, from, from the creation of universes, to that chick pecking its way out of, out of the egg, to the leaves, easily letting go, easily letting go of, of the tree, just letting them go. They no longer serve their purpose. Let them go. In abundance, let them go. And we start to realize that life is moving. Life is moving. Life is expanding. Life is growing. Life is changing constantly, not just every once in a while, but constantly, life is changing. You know. As we sit here together listening to this talk, billions of cells in our body have left, and billions of new cells have taken their place constantly. And we're not aware of it. We don't, we don't struggle over it. You know, we don't fight over it. We don't say, oh, no, oh, no, that was my favorite cell. I don't want to let that go. It just, it's part of life, you see. It just takes place. Universes come, universes go. Stars come, stars go. Planets come, planets go. Bodies come, bodies go. But life, the life principle behind all of that was never born and shall never die. So we come to recognize then that we are that life principle in expression as us, as us. And we too are constantly changing. We too are constantly growing. Our physical bodies are constantly changing and constantly growing. But more importantly, more importantly, we must consider 
our consciousness. We must consider the activity of mind. We must consider these things that we call ideas and beliefs and biases that we hold on to. And the reason they are so important is that we understand <clears throat> that bodies come and bodies go. We understand that for matter, there is a birth and there is a death. But that for consciousness, there is neither as a reality, only as an experience. So consciousness continues, you see. Where was consciousness before it appeared here as us? And where is consciousness after it leaves here? as us. And in this continuum of life then, these ideas, these beliefs, these opinions that we hold continue to outpicture, continue to affect our experience for a long time, till we change them, till we let them go. So being here now being in this world now, having this bodily experience now, is a perfect time for us to learn how to train our minds. To learn how to become aware of the activity <laughs> of the mind, to see that stray dog wandering, and to learn how to bring, bring our mind back where we want it. Again, the image of the good shepherd with the, the stick with the little hook on the end of it, the little crook. When the little lamb wanders away, the good shepherd brings it back close in where it can protect the little one. The sheep represent our thoughts. When we get to the Christmas narrative, we, we will look at the, the reason that the shepherds are in the fields watching over their sheep. Even though if it was wintertime, they wouldn't be there. There's a, there's a meaning to that. So one thing, one thing that helps then, so, so where we are is we belong, and life is expanding. And if we do not expand with it, if we, if we try to stay in the same place, if we try to, to delude ourselves into thinking that everything is just going to be the same, nothing is going to change around us, everything is, is, is going to be the same, the people that we love, well, they're just going to live forever, nobody's ever going to leave us, and all of those kind of things, we create problems for ourselves because we are not seeing things as they are. We are seeing things as we want them to be. And what we find then is that we have created this, this dream world because we thought it would make us happy. And in fact, it makes us suffer. And in fact, it makes us suffer. It makes us suffer because every once in a while we bump up against the reality that it's not the way we thought it was. It's not, it's not the way we think it should be. And the problem is with our should. It is not with life itself. So life is growing, life expanding, life is moving forward, life is constantly changing, it is moving from one form to another form to another form to energy to form and back and forth, and you and I are part of that. This is the impermanence of life the impermanence of life. Nothing is permanent, and yet we try to make it permanent. We try to make it <clears throat> stay the same. When we first started taking class in the early 90s, uh, there was a gentleman in our class who was from uh, North Dakota, and he was going back home for <clears throat> a high school reunion. I guess it was, must have been like a 25th high school reunion he was going back home for. And he came back, and he, he was extremely disappointed. He said, you know, I guess F. Scott Fitzgerald was right. You can't go back home. He said when he went back home, <clears throat> he went back to the, to the tavern where he and his friends used to hang out. And he says they were still there. The same guys were still there, sitting on the same bar stool, drinking the same drinks, 
and telling the same stories about high school football games that they had played 25 years before. He, he said, nothing changed except they, they looked older. They hadn't, they, in his judgment, and of course he was judging, in his judgment they hadn't changed, and that bothered him. Now, of course the reason it bothered him, you would say, is that he was at a point where he was trying to grow, he was trying to move forward, and he didn't want to remain stuck in the past. And so, so when we judge another, we're judging ourselves. But we are like that. Human beings are like that. We try to create the illusion that everything is just going to stay exactly like it was when we, when we were having a good time. And that's not the way life works. So the point here is that we must be growing. We must be expanding. We must be moving forward. And if we are not, it becomes uncomfortable for us. And if you read the email I sent last night, you know, can you imagine that you and I are going on, on a journey? You know, we used to live down at, at Carolina Beach and had a sailboat tied to the dock. So imagine we're going out this weekend and we're going to take that sailboat <clears throat> out the inlet and we're going to head to Bermuda. You know, it's about a five-day sail off the coast. So we get the boat ready. We make sure all the guy wires are tight. We load the boat up with food and water and all the supplies that we're going to need. We have maps and charts and compasses and GPSs and all of that. And we get in the boat and start the engine because we need to use the engine to motor out. And put the engine in gear and give it a little bit of gas and you can he hear the propeller pushing against the water. But the boat doesn't move. I say, why not? And we look over the side, and we're still tied to the dock. No one let go of the line. We can't move forward while we're holding on to the past. We can't experience that which is already there if we won't let go of the ideas that are keeping us from experiencing it. Remember we said, the goodness is here, the perfection is here, the divinity is here, the love of God is here already. It cannot be otherwise, because it is everything and everywhere. But we don't realize it. In the Gospel of Thomas, the disciple asked Jesus, where is this kingdom you keep talking about? And the answer was, it is everywhere present, but people do not see it. Osho gives us a great example of a mirror. He says, can you imagine that you have a mirror and the mirror is hanging on the, on the wall? But no one ever cleans the mirror. So over time it gets an accumulation of dust. Now the mirror is still fine. The mirror is still perfect. The mirror is still a mirror. It is <clears throat> exactly what it always was. But you and I can't see it, you see, because it's covered with dust. And that mirror represents the pure consciousness that we are. That little, that little flame of the divine, the little spark of the divine, I think Emerson called us. He said, we are already inlets that might become outlets. And Emerson also said God's work will not be done by cowards. And at first we might think that means <clears throat> we need to go out there and be brave against something out there. But it really means we need to turn within and be brave against what we find within. Again, jumping back to Joseph Campbell, he, he talks about the, <clears throat> the symbolism that goes with the chakras in, in the uh, Hindu system. And there's one character in, in, the, um, in that system, and it is a goddess of destruction, Kali, I believe. And, and she's often depicted wearing like a grass skirt with a belt, and around that belt are many skulls dangling off of that, off of that belt. 
and not understanding the symbolism, we would look at that and say, oh my goodness, you know, what does that have to do with spiritual growth? And Campbell tells us that's when we turn within and we find all of the ideas within us that no longer serve us. And we get rid of them. We get rid of them. The courage is to go within. Not to distract ourselves with trying to change what's out there, but to go within. So one of the things that I learned along the way when I was, when I was working in organizational development, I had, to, I had to stop and look at how do people become the way that they are. Right? So there's this, there's this myth that people, people resist change. And I found people don't resist change, but their ideas do. Their belief system does. So rather than getting angry with people for not changing, we need to understand where did the belief system come? And how do we change that belief system? How do we update that belief system? So the, the image that I came up with was that human beings are like cartographers. We are like map makers. We're born into this world, we start to have experiences, and as we have experiences, we draw mental maps of the way things are. This is the way things are. This is the way things are supposed to be. And it doesn't matter whether there's an actual cause and effect relationship between things. If two things happen at the same time, we assume that they're related. And we create, we create this mental map of the world the way it is. And very often that map is flawed. It's not the way things are. It's just the way that we experience them and the way that we kind of tie things together. But we hold on to those maps and we assume that our view of the world is right. And if we are living in the, in the delusion that nothing can change because if things change, then things are going to die. So we don't want to die, so we don't want things to change, right? So this is, this is again, in, in some of Osho's work, he says, until we overcome the fear of death, we're never going to learn to live. Because we're always going to be pretending. We're always going to be avoiding. We are always going to be be making up these little stories that are not true. And then we have to try to protect those stories, right? <clears throat> like like in the in the story of the Buddha, how his father tried to protect him from discovering that the world was was not out there, was not like it was in the castle, created this illusion for him. So we create these little mental maps about the way things are and the way things ought to be and what is right and what is wrong. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to, trying to protect them, trying to only see things that agree with them, right? Confirmation bias, the, the psychologists would call it. And things that don't agree with them, we just dismiss. Well, they're, they're wrong or, or they're, they're, they're a trick or they're not, you know, we just don't pay any attention to that. Kind of like... Kind of like Scarlett O'Hara in, the, in the Gone with the Wind. We won't worry about that today. We'll worry about that tomorrow. And, of course, tomorrow never comes. So the example I used in, in, uh, in coaching organizations on change that might be helpful here is, I said, suppose, you know, do you all remember growing up and, and getting your car for the first time and learning how to drive and, and learning the streets and the layout of the streets in your town? And, and, and you know, you kind of memorize. This is before GPS, right? we kind of memorize things. Well, you go, you go three stoplights and you turn right, and then you go two stoplights and you turn left, and there you are at the high school, you know. And we learn our way around by creating these mental maps, these mental maps of the town in which we lived. So now, like my, my friend, you go back for your 25th reunion, and you go to the airport, <laughs> and you go to the rental car counter, and, and the clerk at the rental car counter says, would you like a map? And you say, oh, no, I grew up here. I know every street here by the back of my, like the back of my hand. I don't need a map. So you get in the car and you start driving from the airport and you say, now I go, I go three stoplights from the airport and I turn right. So you go three stoplights from the airport and you turn right. And then you find out what... Well, now wait a second. This isn't this isn't like it used to be. I'm not sure I'm in the right place. You know, <clears throat> there's all these stores that weren't here. You know. Oh wait a second. You know, 
Maybe they've added some streets since I left, since I grew up. So you kind of backtrack a little bit. You turn around, you go back, and you go back to the airport, and you start counting. You say, oh, yeah, it's not the third stoplight anymore. It's the sixth stoplight. Now, what has happened here? The mental map that you created as a child learning how to drive was no longer valid. Now, do you get angry with yourself? Do you beat yourself up? Do you say, I'm a terrible person? No. You say, oh, oh, I see. It's time to update my mental maps. That's it. It's time to update my mental maps. And in learning how to, to help people realize that to uncover the ideas that they were holding on to that were no longer valid, and to address the exercises, just simply, it's time to update your mental maps. The change efforts became much easier. So I invite you to consider the same. As, as you have been growing up from, the, from before the time your body entered the world, <clears throat> before, you, before you were birthed, even while it was in the womb, you've been absorbing information and ideas and you've been forming these little mental maps about who you are and the way things work and the way things ought to work and what is right and what is wrong and, and who, who is one of us that we can love and who is not one of us that we need to be afraid of and all of these different things that we, we have latched on to that it's time to let go of. It's time to let go of. I can't remember which book it was in that I read, but, but there was a story about a place in the world where they, uh, they hunted monkeys. This was one of their food sources. And, the, and of course, they're pretty quick. But the way that they captured them was they took a gourd and they made a tiny hole in the gourd. And in the gourd, they dropped fruit because the monkeys loved fruit. And then they, tie, <clears throat> they tied the gourd to a tree. And the monkeys would come along, and they would smell the fruit, and they would stick their hand in that hole. And the hole was just big enough that they could get their hand in. But when they reached down and they grabbed a handful of fruit, and they tried to come out, their fist would not come back out through the hole. And the monkeys would stay there stuck they would stay stuck to that gourd because they would not let go. They would not let go. We stay stuck. We stay stuck because we don't let go. We won't let go of old ideas that no longer serve us. So at some point in our growth, I think what I'm going to do here is we'll continue on next week with some specific techniques for letting go. Okay? We have hopefully come to an understanding that it is not really what we know. And I, and I just need to explain there's a difference between knowing and knowledge. It's, it's not really the things that we don't know that keep us from growing. But it is the things that we know to be true that are not true. You see, that's the problem. We have all of these ideas. We have all of these beliefs. We have all of these things inside of our, our consciousness. Those are our mental maps. We're driving around trying to make the world that has changed conform to a map that we created 25 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And life, by its very nature, has moved forward. And we may not have moved forward with it. 
I met a young lady one time, and she was uh, she was talking about her her wedding, and she and her husband went to uh, to see their minister for uh, for prenuptial uh, counseling. I think it was a Lutheran minister she mentioned, and and what he said to her, he says to both of them, he said. Now, from the time you were born, it was like you were wearing a backpack. You know, had little children wear backpacks when they go to school. From the time you were born, you've had this backpack on. And many of the people you met along the way, your parents, your teachers, your clergy, your friends, they've been putting little rocks in your backpack. This is the way it ought to be. This is the way it should be. We do this, we're not like that, and all of these other things. And in this example, uh, the minister was saying, and they gave you lots of rocks about what marriage is and what marriage ought to be. And his advice to this couple, which, which I remember because I thought it was just, you know, so bang on. He said, if you truly want to enter into this marriage, the two of you are going to have to sit down and open up your backpacks and take out the rocks that other people have put in there one at a time. And you're going to have to ask yourself, is this true for me? Do I really believe that? Do I want my life to be guided by this? And if the answer is yes, you can put it back in. And if the answer is no, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Throw it away. Just don't let it go. Throw it away. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about. We have come into this world. We have, we have absorbed all of these ideas that are represented by the rocks in the backpack. We, our life is guided by our idea of, of this right and wrong, this idea of the way it should be, this idea of the way that it ought to be. And most of that is wrong. Most of that is not tied to reality. Most of that is just opinion. Some of it is, is direct fabrication in that adults told us stories because they were afraid that if they told us the truth, we wouldn't be able to handle it. You know? It's time to grow up. It's time to take that little chick egg tooth <clears throat> that the divine has given us, and it's telling us, peck through, peck through this wall of ideas that have been surrounding you and protecting you from discovering things as they are. We need to be able to learn how mind works, our mind. We need to be able to learn how to train our mind. And in order to do that, we need to be able to let go. We have to look at the old mental maps and ju just, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever cleaned out a very old car before it's gone to the junkyard, but it's amazing because there's always, a, in the olden days, there was always a road map in the glove box that was about 30 years old. Oh, that, that's from that time we took a trip down to North Carolina. Oh. Now we take that old map and we just throw it in the trash bag because we realize it is obsolete. We don't hold on to it and say, oh my goodness, that was my favorite map. And we just throw it away. We need to be able to do that with the ideas that no longer serve us. So next week, we're going to continue, but next week we're going to talk about techniques, about practice. So now you have the theory of why we're trying to do this. Next week, we are going to go into how do we do this. For your 
for your homework this week. And Kathy Gilmer is going to check on you. She does that for us. For your homework this week, catch yourself. Catch yourself. When, when a little discourse is taking place in your head, ask yourself why. What do I have to believe in order for that discourse to, to make any sense? Catch yourself in, in allowing your actions to be guided by things that, that no longer matter that things that may have been appropriate 50 years ago, but they're not appropriate now, you know. <laughs> In my house, we still use the term icebox. They existed when I was a kid. The ice man used to come and put a block of ice in, you know. <laughs> but now they're refrigerators. We still use the term icebox. Grandchildren come over and say, go to the icebox and get a, get a can of soda. And they say, what's an icebox? What is that? Hmm. It's time to let go of some of these old ideas. Time to let go of these old beliefs because they affect not only your life here, but they will remain in your consciousness as your life moves to the next adventure. Learn how to do it here. Learn how to do it now. Learn how to do it. Well, you can train your mind. Be happy. Till next week. And so it is. Alrighty. <clears throat> I'm going to do the closing treatment uh, today. And we're going to continue with this theme of letting go. As we breathe in, we consider the leaves and how easily they let go. We consider the caterpillar that crawls into the cocoon and completely lets go to become the butterfly. As we breathe in, we think of how easily the trees let go of the oxygen. And as we breathe out, how easily we let go of the carbon dioxide to give back to the trees. We recognize that life is a process of letting go. Letting go of the old and accepting the new. We set our intention to easily, easily let go of all of the ideas that are simply no longer true. We remove the dust from the mirror, we discover the bright, shining reflection that has always been there. We open our hearts and we receive the direct knowing of God's presence, of God's love, of God's joy. We are grateful to know that we belong. We are grateful to know that the divine love is pushing us forward, telling us to break out of our shells. To let go of the idea that we are mere mortals. to accept the reality of the soul. And to accept the guidance and the discipline to train our minds.
We release this treatment to the perfect law that responds to us according to our belief. Knowing so certainly it is done that we say together, and so it is. Alrighty 